I'm not gonna lie, I've been waiting to do this video for a long time. We're gonna talk about dry lines, the basics. We're gonna talk about things you need to know when chasing, forecasting, observing, all the things, all things dry line. We're talking about my favorite storm chase target today, and I can't wait. My name is Rachel Center. This is Tornado Titans, where weather, well, it's for everybody. And today we're talking, we're talking the dry line. Because the dry line to me is probably the most misunderstood piece of weather you can find. People all the time, I hear it, hot air and cold air meet, causes tornadoes. Well, it's actually in the central and southern plains at least. It's actually hot air meeting less hot air causes most of our tornadoes in this part of the country. So we're gonna talk about that dry one. We're gonna talk about the meeting of those two air masses and we are going to have a good time doing it. I hope you're ready to learn because well, we're gonna dive right in. So the dry line is the meeting of two different air masses, right? It's the warm and moist air from the Gulf of Mexico flowing northwards meeting the hot and dry air from the desert Southwest. Those two things, meaning on the central and southern plains, most usually are where a lot of the severe weather comes from during the spring and early summer seasons in that part of the country. You can get dry lines in other parts of the world and other parts of the country, certainly, but the most famous, the most classic case, of course, is that Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas dry line. We're gonna talk about it. Let's go. Now to get a dry line, there's a few things that need to be taking place in the atmosphere, right? You need to have that hot and dry air surging out of the desert Southwest. If you don't have that, you can't get a dry line because there's just this really loose moisture gradient. You need those two air masses really butting up against each other. And to do that, to get those two air masses, you need what is basically a low pressure system on the lee side of the Rockies. You need that cyclogenesis because that is going to set in stage everything else. And how do you get that? Well, there's a couple of ways you get a surface flow, right? The most notable, obvious one is because there is upper level energy moving in, which evacuates air, lowers the pressure at the surface, you get a surface low. So oftentimes dry lines are associated with incoming storm systems. That's just, so that's why these things are so notorious because they typically are happening when the ingredients for severe weather are also in place. So when we're talking about the dry line and we're looking through all of the different ingredients that uh, you're looking for on dry line storm days, there's a lot of things to start to, to just like keep in mind. First off, you, the, the rules exist uh, east of the dry line that exist any other storm chase day. You need moisture, you need instability, you need lift, you need wind shear, you need all these things to create storms. Well, the dry line takes care of the lift the moisture will be in place because there's a dry line. There's gotta be moisture in, uh, to the east of it for there to be a dry line. The wind shear is almost always happening because there's some type of upper energy moving over. It may not be strong wind shear. We saw that several times this spring, but you will get some wind shear. And also, well, let's just face it. You're gonna get storms along the dry line a lot of days when there's not much capping. But that cap and the dry line, well, they go hand in hand. When I'm chasing the dry line, there's a couple things I'm looking for as early as noon on observational data. The first thing, are there any dry line bulges? Dry line bulges are a favored area for storm formation. These tend to actually really take shape into the mid late afternoon, but you're looking for these things even on weather models the morning of. But dry line bulges, but the other thing I'm looking for, I'm notoriously, I am scanning satellite data because oftentimes, this is not a rule, this is not something that happens every single time, but often, and something I have noticed over the years is where the first cumulus form, if there are already cumulus at one o'clock on the dry line, that's probably where your first dry line storms are going to form because that's where your convergence is already happening. That's where some lift is already happening. So you're looking for that. You're looking for that, those sorts of visual cues even early on in the day to know which part of the dry line you're going to target. A couple other things that I look for as the day goes on are those cumulus clouds. Where are they becoming most agitated? Something else to look for are cumulus forming on the backside of the dry line because that's usually an indicator of lift in the mid and upper levels coming in over that dry line because you don't get cumulus, really like a lot of cumulus 
in dry air unless there's some lift happening somewhere and that's what's usually happening. So I look for that oftentimes. So something you need to think about with the dry line is that it is not a singular spot on the map. It's not like this really thin line where you go from dry air to moist air. You don't, you don't, you know, it's not that. The dry line is a zone. You want it to be tight. You want that zone to be pretty tight where the gradient between moist air and dry air is pretty, pretty close together. But you do not want, that is not like something that just happens in a small area straight up and down. The dry line is slanted. The dry line is variable throughout. There are areas where that gradient is tighter, areas where it's looser. You can see all this on surface data, but not always, because there are several things that you need to keep in mind with the dry line because it's slanted, because the warm and moist air typically is sliding under that hot and dry air. Oftentimes you're gonna get storms forming in what is warm and moist air, but they're gonna be rising into that warm, that hot and dry air. That's uh, the cap first off, first off, but it could also be a thing where if the winds are blowing really hard out of the west and you don't have a lot of moisture, you're gonna deal with things like dryer entrainment with uh, your updrafts. They're gonna be really tiny little things. Uh, we saw this actually, goodness, uh, May 11th, this, or May 12th, not May 11th, May 12th this year, tiny, tiny updraft towers. And it's because those things were struggling with dry air on the west side of that dry line. So there's several things to look for. We're gonna do a more advanced video eventually uh, talking about some of these things, but just know that the dry line is not a singular point. It's a zone, it's a circulation. It's where two different air masses are meeting and mixing. Often, sometimes when it's stalled, there's a lot of dynamics happening there. There's little mesovortices, little eddies, those sorts of things that are happening along that dry line that are going to help make storms possible. Now, another pro tip I have about forecasting dry lines is what you see on social media, at least, or I have seen over the years, is this tendency to post soundings from zero Z, which is six, seven o'clock during the springtime. It's great, but the dry line, the storms forming on the dry line are going to form between three and 5 p.m. most days. As early as two, as late as six, rarely more on either side of that, but the dry line is going to typically convect in that three to 5 p.m. range. So you need to be looking at 20Z, 21Z, 22Z, 23Z, 19Z. You wanna be looking at all ends of that to see what that cap looks like, how heating is impacting the dry line, those sorts of things. Another pro tip for you is that if you're looking and in you're in, you know, in, in your weather forecasting journey, you're seeing that there's a stout dry line, but these models just aren't convecting. Well, and there's no cap. Well, there's a couple of things that could be happening. First off, the models could be wrong because they are notoriously bad about handling dry line convection. This year, they were notoriously bad about under convecting. They would have one or two storms and you would get seven or eight. I mean, it happened a lot. Models just don't handle dry lines well. You never know what you're going to get on a dry line chase day oftentimes. Another thing to keep in mind about forecasting dry lines and thinking through this stuff is that dry lines oftentimes are going to want to do a couple of things. They're going to want to convect really in a similar time frame. So if you got not much capping, you're gonna get a lot of storms go up in a very small area. These can grow to be supercells, but they can also grow to become a linear cluster too. It happens all the time. So know that dry lines love to convect into the afternoon, but then less so into the night. And one reason for that is because the dry line will retreat a lot of times into the night. Retreating dry lines can form storms. It does happen, but not as often as a stalled or advancing dry line. And so what happens during the day is that dry line will march east and then you get to right before sunset and it just starts scooting back to the west. So just know that that's that 20, 22Z period is where you're really looking for those storms to really fire. And I mean, honestly, you, you want to make sure too looking ahead of the dry line when you're looking at this because the conditions along the dry line in that circulation are going to be a lot different. You're oftentimes going to be hotter and drier than the air to the east. And so if you have these storms that are forming in this hot dry air uncapped, but they're moving into really cooler and more moist air, they're going to have a hard time, right? So there's a lot of different dynamics you want to be paying attention to when you're forecasting the dry line. Now the dry line is most active in that April, May, and June timeframe. 
And that's, you know, that's where you are looking for, for big time dry line days. A lot of the biggest days are dry line days on the central and southern plains. They will also have other components to them, sometimes warm fronts, sometimes outflow boundaries, you know, all kinds of things. But the dry line is where things oftentimes are happening. And if that dry line is active during the spring, the spring's a big one. If it's not, it's a pretty quiet one. That's my, that's my theory about it, at least. So we're going to see if that continues to hold up into the future. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, check out that video uh, right there. Walker Ashley talks about the future of Tornado Alley. Uh, but I really want to stress that when you're looking at dry lines and you're trying to figure out how, what this day is going to do, just know when you're looking through these dry lines and you're trying to uh, dissect days, they're going to oftentimes, models are going to be just a rough guideline. You got to understand all the things we just talked about to understand what a dry line is going to do. Hey, look, you need to subscribe to this channel because this is not the last time we're talking dry lines. We've got lots of different ways we're going to approach this. This was just kind of a broad theoretical overview of dry lines to give you just a few things that you're wanting to look for. We're going to dive into more really granular subjects, more uh, th things that are more complex. We're going to do all of that in the coming weeks and months and hopefully hopefully years. So please do subscribe because we're going to talk weather all the time here. Thanks for watching. And well, you know, the, the, one more tip for the road, just one more, because if you, 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 a lot of people have tuned out already. So if you're still here, congratulations, you're about to get a very special tip. Something that I look for when I am looking at dry line days is storm mode. Storm mode will absolutely determine how a dry line is going to do. Because if those storms are isolated, you're going to get a lot better day. So just remember that you, when you're looking at a dry line day, you're looking for those days where you're going to get isolated storm modes. That's when the shear vector most likely is perpendicular to the dry line, not parallel, perpendicular. If you want to learn about shear vectors, that's the video right there. Remember, weather is for everybody. That includes you. We'll see you next time. I like awake, wanna escape this. Hold tight, the air is changing. Let's run away.